Welcome to another installment of Donning the Armor. This morning we will begin in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 6. Actually, I'm going to start back at verse 1 and then we'll really pick up at verse 6. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Reba. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then, then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him and he lay with her. For she was cleansed from her impurity. And she returned to her house. And the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. So David, from his greatest heights, now has fallen on his greatest sin. Or at least the beginning of it. Because as bad as it is that they've now conceived a child in adultery, or he's conceived, conceived a child in adultery with the wife of a mighty man, who is the daughter of another mighty man and the granddaughter of his chiefest advisor, as if that wasn't bad enough. That outcome wasn't bad enough and wouldn't be destabilizing enough to those closest to him, those around him and those trusted him. Now begins the deceit. Now begins the hiding and the conniving now becomes now comes the moment where david believes that he he considered, feared he'd got away with it you know after all this woman's husband probably her father they're they're out battling they're they're out besieging reba in ammon they're out the battle they're not going to be back for months and months and months so i'm in the clear then the child comes and now the wheels start to spin of, okay, well, how do we cover this up? I'm not going to admit to it. I'm not going to come clean, which is so weirdly interesting because the idea that our sin is ever hidden is, is mind boggling because God sees all our sin is never truly hidden. If I do something against my wife, she may never know. I may be able to hide that sin until the day she dies. But guess what? When I die, I still need to answer to the true judge about what I did because he knows I did it. The idea that we could ever hide a sin it is preposterous. But this is how far David has fallen in this moment. This is how this is how far he has fallen. That now, instead of just coming clean, seeking God's repentance, he needs to hide it. Now there is a reason why he also doesn't want to seek repentance. And it's something we'll see him mention later. Something he'll mention is his Psalms. That God wishes to have no. God will accept no sacrifice, no redemption for what was done for his sin before him. And that comes from the fact that adultery was a death penalty. There was no atoning sacrifice for adultery. What he did, there was no coming back for under the Mosaic law.
I would still say, even still, you fall on the mercy of God. You fall on the mercy of your people. Your people might even let you off the hook whether they should or not. But instead he chose something far darker with far more far-reaching consequences than his own fate and the fate of Bathsheba. Then David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. Now, he doesn't know why he's sending Uriah back. Perhaps he has something to give him, something that is pertinent for the war effort. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and the gift of food from the king followed him. So David's bringing him back saying, you know what? Bring, bring, bring Uriah to me. Joab's probably thinking, our enemies, just one of his mighty men, of course, we'll send Uriah. He's a faithful servant. I'll absolutely sir, send Uriah back to you, David. Uriah comes. David's inquiring about how the war's going, how things are going. Now, normally you'd just have a messenger do this, but perhaps they're thinking, well, he wants Joab. He, want, he wants somebody who know, or he wants Uriah. He wants somebody who knows better than just a messenger. He wants an actual hardened soldier. He wants the word of one of his mighty men. All right. It, it's, it's a little odd. It's, it's a little unusual. But okay, we, we can see this happening. They, they can see this be, be in a course of action. He, he can get better information from one of his hardened soldiers, one of his, one of his most trusted men. He absolutely. How's Joab doing? How's the general doing commanding the army? How is morale? How are the people doing? How's morale in the camp? How is the war gone? How, how many cities are you conquered? How far is the besieging got? Have you made any headway? All these are pretty standard questions. All these are, are pretty thing, pr pretty, um, pretty standard things that are being asked. Wouldn't send up any red flags of anything. But now David's saying, you know what? Go down to your own house. Wash your feet. Go get rest in your own home. Go see your wife. Go be with your wife. Go be at your own house. You've come back from this hard battle. Go enjoy a little bit of R&R. &R. Go rest. Go relax. Go have fun. But your eye doesn't go there. He departs from the king's house. Sure, there's a gift of food that's going to follow him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. So he slept in the servants' quarters. Just goes to sleep in the servants' quarters. He's not going to go to his house. He's going to go to his servants' quarters. He's going to sleep just like all the other servants of King David. He sees himself as no more special than any of those other people. That's where he's going to stay. He might be one of David's mighty men, but he sees himself as one of David's loyal servants, one of his loyal soldiers. These people serve in his house. These people attend to his well-being. I attend to his wars. I attend to the, to the battles that come before the nation. I am a servant with a different job. That's the way Uriah sees himself. In that loyal, honorable fashion. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Saying, hold on, Uriah, why, why didn't you go? Why didn't you go home? You've, you've come from this great journey, which meaning isn't just you were at war, but all the time it took for you to journey all the way here. Why are you sleeping in the servants' quarters? Go home. Go rest and relax. You've come this way. You'll be here a day or two and you'll go back out. Be relaxed. Be the best you can be. Go to your house. Get as much rest as you can. That way you can be at your, your top of your game when you head back into the battle. 
And Uriah said to David, the ark in Israel, the ark in Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. So his easy response is, David, the mercy seat of God, the Ark of the Covenant, are dwelling out in tents in the middle of a battle in an open field. Israel, Judah, granted they're all one united nation of Israel, but after one crowned Ithbosheth and one crowned David, that schism never really healed and only gets worse after the death of Solomon, where they completely sever ties with each other. So saying Israel and Judah, they're all dwelling in tents. Even Joab and the rest of the army, the servants of you, my Lord, they're all encamped in open fields. I'm not going home. And that's how what he follows up with. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? The, the mercy seat of God himself is out in a tent. And I should go to my house and eat good food and drink good food while they're eating rations. And I should go lie with my wife and enjoy my marital obligations, my, my, th- th- this blessing of love with my wife while they're encamped in tents with their lives on the line. As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. And it's very interesting because in a way, it seems very much as though Uriah is looking at the example of the David of the past. David, you're you're in your house, you're with your wives, you're with your concubines. Because you're the king now. We're your servants. But David, do you not remember all the years we were running? All the years we were dwelling in camps and sleeping in caves. Do you not remember all of these things? And you wouldn't do anything that put you on a higher pedestal than the rest of us. You wouldn't ask us to do anything that you wouldn't have done. Don't you remember that the example you set during all these years we were together? Don't you remember the example you set in our lives? A living example of how to be a servant of God. How to be a warrior and a leader among the nation of Israel. So while all these people are out there living in tents in the open field, fighting for their lives, living on rations, you think I'm going to go home and eat good food and get drunk and lie with my wife? I'm going to get the, the leisurely pleasures of peace time while the rest of my brethren are camped out in a, a field and a time of war? As you live, as your soul lives, David, I won't do this. I will honor the example that you set in my life. It's interesting because Solomon would go on to write, raise up a child in the way that he should go and he will not depart. Now that's not a promise of God. That's a principle of God. Because there are many people that raise up and do their best raising their children a good godly way and they go prodigal and they go off and they don't believe and they live blasphemous sinful lives possibly for the rest of their lives while their parents are praying and hoping for them to come back to the Lord. So it's not a promise. It's not like, oh, well, your kid went prodigal because you didn't do a good enough job. But it's a principle that if you raise your children right in the way of God, They'll return to that and they'll stay with that. And they will also live that way and raise their children that way. It's not a promise, but it's a very strong principle. And here we have Uriah living out that principle. 
almost as if as a spiritual and and um almost as a spiritual child of David. David being the leader of his mighty men through all these treks through the wilderness, hiding and fearing Saul and and refusing to stretch out his hand against him and refusing the refinement of life that would have come had he slayed Saul. You have this example, this lived example of David that Uriah has learned from and simply will not depart from it. I will not do this thing. Not while they're out there, I won't enjoy the life of peace, even if it's for a night, because I belong out there with my brethren. I'm not going to compromise in the oaths we took to each other because it's just before my eyes. I'm not going to give in the temptation of easiness and allow it to soften myself before I go back out in the war where I'm going to be fighting in life and death battles with those men. Then David said to Uriah, wait here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. So David, David's wheels are churning. It's going, okay, I tried to send him home. I tried to send him to his wife. That way he could lay with his wife and we can claim that the baby was his. And that way no one will be the wiser. Even if, even if the, even if the baby comes out looking like me and people will go, yeah, that baby looks a lot like David. They can always just play it off and people will have their whispers, but it'll be Uriah and Bathsheba's child. It'll be their son. They'll raise the baby. It'll be theirs. The sin will be forgotten. It'll be wiped out as if it never happened. My hands are clean. But Uriah still doesn't want to participate in that. Uriah doesn't know why David wants him to go home. He doesn't know why he's so insistent. Maybe he just thinks David's being magnanimous. You know, these people see themselves as David's servant. They see him as the good, godly king who seeks after the heart of God and seeks to do good by his people. Not to take advantage of them the way Saul did. So he's, he's got to be seeing this as, man, David really cares for me, but I'm sorry, David, I, I can't do that. I will feel as though I am dishonoring my fellow brethren who are out in the field of battle. Now, when David called him, he ate and drank before him and made him drunk. And at evening, he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord. But he did not go down to his house. So David goes as far as getting him drunk. That way he'd stumble home, not realizing what he's doing, lay with his wife, and it could all be. David and Bathsheba's sin could just be all forgotten. Just be as if it never happened. No one will be the wiser. Uriah is the one. You know, it. It. it what always comes down to my mind when I think of this is, why David just didn't have Uriah physically taken to his house? I mean, if he had got him that drunk, why he didn't just have someone escort him literally to his home against his will, kind of throw him in his house and just let him be there. And then if he's that drunk out of his mind, just convince him that he did lie with Bathsheba. I mean, he'll, he'd never know. He'd wake up drunk out of his mind. But then again, that shows how scheming the heart of any man is because I can look at this and be like, you know, I think this is where David went wrong in his schemes because we are all given into some level of wickedness and duplicity when it comes to doing nefarious activities. We're not any better than David. And it's interesting that a lot of people will say that none of these things happened 
and this is just something that to use to unify the nation of Israel. And all of the books of the Bible are just done to convince people to believe in some magical sky daddy or used to control the poor populace to accept their lot in life so they serve the richer people. But if you were trying to create a document to make yourself, your religion, your national people, you're trying to create this, this document to glorify your people and make them seem so special and majestic and so much greater than everyone else, you simply would not record these things. These things are embarrassing. David is Israel's greatest king. And his greatest sin is talked about at length and in great detail. You wouldn't do that if it was all a lie. When we lie, we don't tend to lie in a way that embarrasses us. We lie in a way that makes us look good, but not just flat out embarrass us and makes us fall flat on our face. That's not what you would write. That's not, that's not what you would create from your greatest king if you were making this wholesale and not having it been a actual historical document. You simply wouldn't write all of these embarrassing details about your nation and its history. You would blot them out, which is what many, many ancient cultures did. People will say, well, the, the Jews were never in Egypt because there's no Egyptian record of them having slaves or them going out of Israel. Why would you expect there to be? Why would you expect Egyptian historians to write, oh yeah, and then uh, we had the firstborn of all of our nations slaughtered, so we let them go as we were weeping and burying our dead, but then we got kind of mad, so we chased them to the Red Sea. But then our entire army drowned. Yeah, you know, it wasn't a real good day for us. Nobody's going to write that. Nowadays, people do. Or at least Western society does. But even you look at communist China, they don't write anything about their mistakes. They've never made a mistake. Communist North Korea, the USSR, they've never made mistakes. Everything their nation has done and their leaders have done have always been absolutely perfect. We view ancient history through what we would record today because we have no problem recording the failures and the embarrassments of our, of our leaders. And you want to know why we have that, that tendency? It's because we're a Judeo-Christian society that grew up on the scripture that recorded the actual embarrassing history of Israel. That's why. We're an anomaly. Israel was an anomaly. The rest of the world is what you would expect to see. People embar a, a, just burying these embarrassing moments. If this was written in Egypt, King David would never come off looking this bad. If it had been written in Babylon, King David never would have looked this bad. If it had been written in Assyria, King David never would have looked this bad. Because they never would have allowed their kings to look this bad. But Israel had no, no qualms with making their kings look as bad as they were. Because there was only one king that mattered, and that was the God king. That was Yahweh. That's all that mattered. Him and his Messiah to come. So when you have David sinning greatly and trying to cover it up, when you have kings yet to come as we get to kings and chronicles and you look at all their failures, the Jews looked at that and just said, this is our history. We're going to write it because we want to honor God and we want everyone who comes after us to understand that it is God that matters, not your king, not your leader, not your politician. We as a nation now, once again, have gone back to worshiping our politicians. The first time I remember it happening, 
even though it was a little weird with Bill Clinton. But Barack Obama was the first time I remember a political party actually almost pretty much worshipping at the feet of a politician in this country. He could do no wrong. If you, if you had left-wing politics, Barack Obama could do no wrong. Nothing. No, no vile evil he could commit. No outright lie he could tell. No, no societal norm he could destroy. That would be recorded as such by people on the left wing of politics. He was their messiah. They, he was their prophet. He was the second coming of everything they could possibly want. Then you have Donald Trump to come after. And now you have the right wing's Obama. No matter how stupid of a thing Donald Trump did, how no matter how moronic he would sound, no matter what idiotic lie he would come up with that was painfully stupid, people on the right would defend him. Try to find a way to spin it to where he's just playing 4D chess. And he's just so brilliant. You just don't understand his brilliance. No, he's an idiot. He's always been an idiot. Just a rich idiot. Also quite humorous, but he's still an idiot. This time and the time of Israel are the anomaly where we have no problem bashing our leaders. It's not so for most of the world. It's just so for nations that were formed on these Judeo-Christian ethics. Because when you put God first, nothing man does matters. If you have to shame him, you have to shame him because it's what matters to God that matters most. So mentioning all these humiliating details of David is not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things to the Jewish writer, the Jewish believer. Or the Christian, for that matter. And it's also a great... It's it's a great love letter from God to us in our age now. To show this is the man he calls a man after his own heart. He called it to David that by that title to Saul through the mouth of Samuel. Possibly before David was even born that I'm going to anoint a man after my own heart, which would go on to be David. That you can see someone who fits that description fall this hard and this bad. It's a love letter to us so that we know that no matter what we think we've done, or beclowned ourselves by doing. How soiled we think we are. This is the man God called a man after his own heart. And the unbelieving world will look at that and they will look at the evil David did and the wrongs and the sins and see, that's what your God considers a man after his own heart. Somebody who will adulter, somebody who will kill, someone who will murder, Someone who will do vile acts and what would be considered war crimes in our day and age. That's the guy. That's the guy your God likes. That's how evil your God is. But it's a reminder to us who know the scripture, who love the scripture, who trust the scripture, to work out why was it that God called this sinful, fallen Occasionally depraved man, a man after his own heart. It's because God, David always turned to him. And that's what God asks of us. That no matter how far we fall, we turn back to him and seek him. Something Saul didn't do, something Solomon won't do, but something David will. 
In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. Now that is an awful, awful thing. You have a man delivering his own death sentence to the commander. Not knowing. Because that's how loyal Uriah was. It's a letter for Joab, so Uriah was never going to try to look. I'm sure it was sealed, but Uriah could have made up any other reason, and Joab might have actually believed him. But he doesn't read the letter. Set Uriah, this man who I violated his wife, I violated his marriage, but because he was loyal to you, and loyal to your brethren, and loyal to the ark of God, that thing that David danced so mightily in front of, and loyal to me that he wouldn't go home to cover for my sin, now you need to make sure he dies. When God would say that the heart of man is desperately wicked, or it say in, uh, I think it was Jeremiah, the heart of man is desperately wicked, who can know it? This is the heart of man. This is the heart of man without God. I've sinned. How can I cover for my sin? I need to hide it. I need to obfuscate it. Or I need to eliminate it. So no one knows. But it doesn't undo the sin. So since Uriah wouldn't unknowingly cover for David's sin. He now needs to die because when he gets back from the battle, he's going to find his wife pregnant. And if it had not been for that little tidbit of her being washed from her uncleanness, they could have always just said, hey, Uriah impregnated Bathsheba before he left for the war. But she was cleaned ritualistically and apparently publicly, at least to a degree. Other people were washing her. She's an upper class person. She's not a poor person. She's, as I said, the grandchild of one of David's major main counselors. So there's some wealth in that the child of one of his mighty men and the wife of one of his other mighty men. She is one of the elites in Jerusalem. So it's known that she was not pregnant before David. So now he needs to destroy the evidence. He needs to destroy Uriah. So that way he can't find out when he returns. And that is the reward for loyalty when it comes to the hearts of men. People are very fickle. And when you don't give them what they want, they turn on you. When people live in sin and you're not willing to affirm that sin or help them hide that sin, you are of no use to them. And because Uriah didn't help David hide his sin, he now has become of no more value to David. So it was that while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Far-reaching consequences. Uriah is not the only one to die. There are other soldiers. Uriah the Hittite died also. In order to hide and obfuscate his sin, he didn't take the lives of one man. He took the lives of some. We don't know what that some is. We don't know how many exactly. But there are more people who died. 
David because he would have been under the authority of the law and could have seen himself and Bathsheba stoned to death for the sin of adultery before God. Now sees many people dying to hide that one sin in order to protect his own skin, something David of the past never would have done. David the shepherd never would have done. David the the soldier in exile never would have done. But David the king is doing. More of what Samuel or God through Samuel warned the people of. That a king will take what they want without any regard to you. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath arise, and he says to you, Why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? Was it not a woman who cast a piece of millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So that is a, the Abimelech reference was, if I'm re remembering correctly, back from um, Joshua. Or possibly even Judges. But this man was besieging the city, was coming against them. And a woman just cast the millstone over the wall and smashed his skull. And then as he's dying on the ground, he didn't want to be considered dead by a woman, so he asked one of his soldiers to stab him the way that um, King Saul tried to get his, his armor bearer to do. But Joab, as I said, Joab, mighty man, battle-hardened warrior. Joab's a psychopath. This is a man who slaughtered Abner because his, he killed his brother in war. He always slaughtered him in times of peace. This is a man who at one word from David, one word, slaughters another mighty man. Somebody who probably fought by his side for years and years and years and without a second thought slaughters him. Make sure he dies. That is some level of heartless that we often don't like to recognize in the hearts of men. That we like to put to the side and pretend that it's not there, but it really is. That when people do not live for the glory of God, when they live in sin, when they live in rebellion... They live for themselves and what will satisfy themselves and satisfy their lusts and satisfy whatever good feeling comes to them, whatever will bring them that momentary happiness, that momentary level of, uh, uh, of an emotion spike that gives them excitement and happiness and what they misconstrue as joy that momentary high that they seek by constantly chasing happy. That's the, that's the heart of men and the disregard for their fellow man. Joab saw Uriah as just disposable because the king said he was disposable. And these decisions will not just haunt David, but will haunt Joab as well. Because these actions of, him, uh, of Joab will also not be forgotten. And will not be forgiven so easily. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him, or sent by him. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. Then we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. 
The archers shot from the wall at your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead. And your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messengers, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. Don't let it displease you, for the sword devours one as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. Encourage Joab not to let this displease you. Not to let this be an issue. Because Joab himself can rat out David and say, David told me to kill Uriah. But the sword devours one as well as another in such a cold-hearted, nasty way. The sword didn't devour Uriah. David did. David's lust did. David's needing to hide his sin did. The sword didn't devour Uriah. The the knife in the back devoured Uriah. The knife in the back that was wielded by David. Then the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, and she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, because she had Jews sit Shiva for seven days in a mourning process. So when that time was over, much like her, her washing of her impurity was over. David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The first time we see the Lord's opinion in the whole business of this chapter is that it displeases him, which we would expect no less. But he brings her into his house. She becomes his wife. And then they can claim that the child was born after the, after the marriage. Maybe the child's a little premature, they could say. But hiding your sin, hiding it from men, killing those who might know and might find out. But there's only one judge that matters, and it's not a man. It is God. And he already knows because there is no hiding things from him. Jonathan Trapp had an interesting comment on this that's kind of poignant and interesting when you think about it. David was better while a servant than when a king. For being a servant, he feared to kill Saul, his adversary. But becoming a king, he basely slew his most faithful friend and dutiful subject. All the while Saul was trying to kill David, he said he wouldn't even stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed. But once that hurdle was gone and that crown was placed on his head, then all of a sudden, loyalty was met with murder. All that time, David twice holding his hand back from Saul when he had a chance to kill him. And shouting, how have I been disloyal to you that you are coming after me? How have I been disloyal to you, King Saul, that you seek my life? Now juxtapose that with King David, who over a two-day period, witnesses the absolute loyalty of Uriah. And David doesn't think back to young David and his cries to Saul about, I've been loyal to you, why do you seek my life? And apply that to Uriah. Uriah has been nothing but loyal. But David slaughtered him anyway. So who's truly better, King Saul or King David? Saul tried to kill David because he saw him as a threat to his throne. David killed Uriah 
because he could have revealed his sin. One of those men is considered repugnant in the eyes of God. The other is considered a man after God's own heart. By an earthly fashion, by a human fashion, those statements don't make sense. Saul's the repugnant one when he was just trying to keep somebody from killing him and taking his throne. I mean, it wasn't true, but he believed it. But David, in an effort to hide his sin before man, kills one of his loyal servants, just as Saul tried to do to him. Only David succeeds. Where David was saved, Uriah dies. Where Saul was unsuccessful, David was successful. We might end up being in positions of power in, over the course of our lives. We might be in positions over people. We might be in a place of authority. But this is why Christ tells us that the greatest amongst us will be the one who lives as a servant. When David was a shepherd, when David was a servant, he was of a heart that would never have allowed this to happen. Shepherd David would never have done this to Uriah. But King David, with that authority, with that ultimate temptation, because ultimate power corrupts ultimately. Absolute power corrupts absolutely is actually what the, the saying is. With that absolute power, he became corrupted and he could not face his temptation because he believed he was deserving of anything he laid his eyes on. And as far as David's fallen, there's still one more notch he has to be knocked down in the next chapter. Because this is his effort to hide his sin before man. But this effort displeases God. And God will have a rebuke and a reminder for David that no matter what you tried to hide before man, you will hide nothing before me, the God Almighty, creator of the universe, the one who formed you in your mother's womb. Nothing is hidden from me. And ultimately, I will be the one to judge you, not the people around you. As a servant, David looked to save people and honor people, faced giants to do so. King David slaughtered one of his closest allies, one of his mighty men, to hide the sin that he committed against Uriah. And there are so many what ifs. What would have happened if David had just faced the music, faced up to the act consequences of his own actions? What if he had brought Uriah back and although Uriah was loyal and went back to the battle and they had success and he came back to find his wife pregnant? I wonder if in that situation Uriah comes back, he finds his wife pregnant and David pulls him aside and says, I slept with your wife. That is my baby. Can you please hide my sin and my iniquity against you and raise it as your own and love your wife in spite of what we did to you? I wonder if Uriah's loyalty would have extended so far to agreeing to that. But instead of any of these, David chose deceit, murder, and it wasn't just Uriah, but others who now are left widowed and orphaned. 
all because David's absolute power corrupted him absolutely and left him incapable of saying no to the temptation that presented itself before him. We cannot allow ourselves to fall in the same fashion. We're never going to be a King David. But we do have authority in different aspects of our lives. And we cannot allow ourselves to be corrupted in a way that perverts doing good in righteousness in the eyes of God. If we need to throw ourselves on the mercy of men in order to please the Lord, that's what we should do. That's what David should have done. But he didn't. And now his negative example stands as a testament to us of how far the human beings can fall even when they are the anointed of God. But how the Lord doesn't leave them. The Lord still loves them. The Lord is still capable of blessing them. If they turn back, repent, and go to him. In humility. In honest, honest repentance. And brokenness before him. David serves as our example that no matter how far we fall. The Lord has never abandoned us in the way that we've abandoned him in our sin. We might have chosen sinfulness over his righteousness, but he's not abandoned us in the same way that we've turned our back on him. He loves us. He blesses us. And he is always right there ready to reconcile with us. If we can get over being in a state of pridefulness in our brokenness. So many times we can look at our brokenness, look at our sin, and almost in a way of pride say that we have sinned so bad that we're so special in our sin that God won't forgive us. But we ain't that special. We ain't that unique. We have not done anything that anybody else hasn't done before us. So repent, turn back to God, let him bless you, let him embrace you and reconcile with your father because he loves you. And he's willing to forgive if you're willing to actually seek forgiveness. So that's where we shall end it for this morning. I hope this was fruitful for you. I hope to see you back again next time. But until then, be blessed.